As an oil and gas exploration and production company, or E&P for short, Hibiscus Petroleum extracts, produces and sells crude oil and gas to the global markets. As long as OPEX per barrel is below average realized oil price, the company will be... Over the past seven years, their revenue grew from 18 million in December 2018 to 646 million in June 2020. Hi everyone and welcome back to our channel, the best place for long-term stock investors. My name is John and in this video, you're going to learn about Hibiscus Petroleum Berhad or Hibiscus for short, stock code 5199. As usual, we'll be covering the history and management, its business model, what is their latest financial status as well as the potential risk and reward before you decide to invest. Hibiscus, what an apt name because it coincides with the name of our national flower. The struggle for a lot of retail investors is that Malaysia has been blessed with so many listed oil and gas players. But how do you decide which one to invest and how do you even evaluate all these businesses? Because there are upstream players, midstream players and downstream players. So the reason why I wanted to do this video because Hibiscus is actually a pure play exploration and production company. There is nothing similar to it and how do we learn how to benchmark it as a retail investor? Hibiscus Petroleum Berhad made history on the 25th of July 2011 as the first SPAC to be listed in Malaysia. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with a SPAC, it stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. When a company seeks a listing on a stock exchange, it has an existing business model that generates profit and has minimum market capitalization. In contrast, a SPAC, which is also called a blank check company, yes, blank check, will seek a listing without having an existing operation or income generating business. It will attempt to raise funds from its public offering with the purpose of acquiring a business later. If it fails to acquire a qualifying business within 36 months of listing, it has to delist and return the money it initially raised to its respective investors. For Hibiscus, it completed its first qualifying asset in April 2012 and subsequently acquired two of its current producing assets. These two assets are the Anansuria cluster located in the UK North Sea from Shell UK in 2016 and the North Sabah fields from Sabah Shell Petroleum Limited in 2018. We'll discuss them more later. Now, let's look at the company's management. We have Inchek Zainul Rahim bin Mohammad Zain, who is the non-independent, non-executive chairman of the company. He has 42 years of experience under his belt, with former stints such as the managing director of Shell Egypt, deputy chairman of Shell Malaysia, as well as current appointments that include Chairman of the Malaysian Dutch Business Council. Next up, Dr. Kenneth Jared Pereira, who is the Managing Director. He started off as a field engineer with Slumberger, then transitioned into leadership roles in Sapura Crest Petroleum before ending up as the Managing Director of Interlink Petroleum Limited before starting Hibiscus. He is also a substantial shareholder of the company with stakes close to 11%. Dr. Kenneth has also assembled a strong leadership team, which includes Mark John Patton, the CEO of Anansuria Habiscus, Mr. Yip Chi Yong, the CFO, as well as Dr. Pascal Host, the CEO of C Habiscus in Number Hut. Have you gotten a copy of our stock portfolio guidebook? This guidebook shows you how to start constructing your six-figure stock portfolio and how the rich invest across different asset classes. Best part, it's free, and you can find the link in the comment sections below. Let's now give you an overview of the company's business model. As an oil and gas exploration and production company, or E&P for short, Hibiscus Petroleum extracts, produces and sells crude oil and gas to the global markets. I'll just use the term oil from this point onwards as it represents any form of oil and gas for simplicity purposes. They do this by bidding either green fields, meaning fields that have not been developed before, to brown fields where the later has an existing production facility in place. In Hibiscus, in Hibiscus's case, in Hibiscus's case, <laughs> the S, because Hibiscus, <laughs> in the company's case, they have a mixture of both green and brown fields, which they own via a production sharing contract or PSC for short, 
or via concessions. Under this arrangement, hibiscus will be given a tenure to develop and operate the field, usually for a duration ranging from 25 to the end of field life for concessions. The operator or contractor will have to come out with their own capital to develop and operate the field but can recover their cost of development and production from the state. This is usually known as cost recovery oil and it is usually kept at a certain percentage of oil revenue. In exchange for these PSCs or concessions, they will pay royalties or taxes to the government and take a cut of what is left of profit oil after cost oil recovery. As of financial year 2020, they have one field under a PSC fiscal regime, which is the North Sabah PSC. And the rest are all under concession systems, namely the Anansuria Cluster, Marigold Cluster, and the Bass Straits Cluster. How does this translate to revenue for the company? Two things, operational metrics and reserves. Let's look at the four key operational metrics that ENP companies measure themselves with. The first is average uptime. The second, average gross oil production. The third, average net oil production. And the last is average OPEX per barrel. Now, notice I did not include average oil prices because that's something beyond the company's control. And instead, you should focus on the average OPEX per barrel. Average uptime simply means how efficient their facilities are functioning. The higher the uptime, the better. But it is impossible for any operator to hit 100% due to planned maintenance or unplanned downtime of a facility. Generally, anything above 90% is very commendable. Next is the average gross oil production and net oil production. They respectively stand at approximately 17,000 barrels and 6,600 barrels of oil per day. What's the difference between the gross and the net, you might ask? Remember the PSCs or concession structures that I described earlier? The net oil is really hibiscus's take of profit oil after netting off taxes, royalties, and cost recovery expenses. Lastly is the average OPEX per barrel. This is the cost hibiscus has to incur to produce a barrel of oil and an important measure of profitability for the company. As long as OPEX per barrel is below average realized oil price, the company will be profitable. So if OPEX per barrel is $15 a barrel and the average realized oil price is $60 a barrel, that difference is what the company makes as a profit. The next part you need to understand is how much does Hibiscus has left in the tank, pun intended, which is reserves. You see, ENP companies buy assets in terms of production blocks and it squeezes as much oil from it during the field life. So the long-term profitability comes from how much will these fields likely have in the ground and how probable it is to extract it. That's why there's a standard way of classifying all this and it boils down to two key terms, reserves or short form for P and resources short form C. For any volumes of oil to be classified as reserves, they must satisfy four criteria, which are discovered, recoverable, commercial, and remaining. For resources, it is an estimated quantity of oil from undiscovered accumulation on the basis of indirect evidence. This just simply means the oil field has not been drilled and the volume is estimated using techniques such as seismic study. As you can see, Reserves is the more realistic figures that investors should be looking at because it stands a higher chance of being produced. And no, reserves doesn't mean that it's guaranteed. It just means that it's been proven to have a higher probability of extraction. Both reserves and resources, which has a prefix number behind them, ranging from 1 to 3, means 1 having the highest probability and 3 being the lowest probability of being recovered or extracted. Does Hibiscus report these figures? In fact, they report it so clearly, you almost have to be blind not to see it. As of financial year 2020, their remaining 2P reserves are 46.1 million barrels, which has reduced from 50.4 million barrels in 2019 as expected. So why all the fuss on P's and C's and the number in front of them like 1P or 2P? This is because there's so many factors that affect oil exploration, including the fact that you don't exactly have a see-through glass to look at the conditions beneath the surface. I'll give you a perspective of how difficult it is. 
Now imagine you're sitting in a room about 400 square feet, which is about the size of a studio apartment. Now imagine poking a straw from the ceiling and trying to reach a glass of water on the coffee table. Yes, one straw. Let's just say you successfully get the straw in and the glass is now filled with rocks, sand and mud. That's permeability and porosity for you. Yes, those are the constraints that e &P companies have to work with to extract oil. One whole room, one straw. There you go, your crash course on Petroleum Engineering 101. So just focus on the 2P guys, that's the standardized number everyone benchmarks. We started this channel to create a like-minded community so they're able to invest their money better. We do this by creating concise but well-researched content. If you like what you've seen, help widen our reach by subscribing to our channel and hitting that like button so we can reach a wider audience. And don't forget to click on that notification bell so you know the next videos are out. What about Hibiscus's financials? For the trailing 12 months ending March 2021, they posted a revenue of 591 million ringgit as opposed to 647 million for the financial year end 2020. They had a net loss of 91 million during the same period, owing to two things impairment of intangible assets and depreciating costs of 188 and 145 million, respectively. This is on top of them having a gross profit of 397 million. The intangible assets are actually the capitalized costs of fuel acquisition, which includes exploration and licensing costs. Remember I mentioned seismic survey earlier? Over the past seven years, their revenue grew from 18 million in December 2018 to 646 million in June 2020, which gives it a KGA of 67%. But guys, please note that this can only happen by them continuously acquiring fields and replenishing their reserves. It is not something they can create, like buying raw materials and processing it in a normal factory. Their operating cash flow stood at 246 million as of the trailing 12 months ending March 2021 and has been positive and growing ever since 2016, which is the year they acquired the Anna Surya cluster. On the balance sheet, they have cash and equivalence of 306 million against a total liability of 857 million. Now, it might seem scary that the total liabilities is almost three times that of cash, but herein lies why deeper understanding of the accounting treatment helps. The biggest chunk of their liabilities come from deferred tax liabilities and provision for decommissioning costs. Think of deferred tax liabilities as hibiscus being given favorable tax treatment for spending capex to develop their fields and therefore getting to pay lesser tax upfront but they eventually have to pay these taxes once the tax depreciation runs out. On the provision of decommissioning costs, each e &P operator will have to restore the condition of the field that was explored to its original condition once the oil reserves have been depleted. So this cost is parked as a non-current liability on the balance sheet upfront to be used when abandonment of this field occurs in the future. Based on what I've explained, it's key to understand the nature of the industry before applying a generalized accounting checklist to assess the company. Having come from the oil and gas industry, I can tell you it is very, very capex and opex intensive. There's so many variables and risks involved, both operational and financial, and the industry takes this risk very seriously. I'll share with you a few key ones, but definitely not an exhaustive list. From an operational perspective, the current producing assets that have been bought by Hibiscus, especially those in North Sabah, are very near end-of-life design. Most oil and gas facilities are designed for a 25 to 30 year operational lifespan and therefore will need upkeep to maintain their technical integrity. Recall earlier I spoke about average uptimes. That's why these uptimes can never be 100% because of the regular shutdowns for maintenance purposes. From a financial and investing perspective, two key risks are oil reserves and potential dilution with its upcoming Convertible Redeemable Preference Shares or CRPS. Should the oil reserves be less than what is currently stated, there's a potential shortfall of future estimated profits that can be generated. The next risk is the dilutive effects of the CRPS. In October 2020, Hibiscus sought to raise 2 billion worth of CRPS 
Assuming all the CRPS is converted, existing shareholders will be diluted three times should they not subscribe to the CRPS. Therefore, shareholders' trust in Hibiscus is key for the management to deliver earnings growth via these fresh funds that the CRPS will bring. Is there any growth catalyst for Hibiscus then? Again, I won't be able to point out every single one, but I'll highlight three key ones. First, it's really the basics. The ability to maintain average OPEX per barrel over extended periods of time is very commendable indeed, especially in a COVID-19 stricken environment, which warrants new SOPs that are very likely to increase costs. By having OPEX per barrel kept at an average of less than 15 US dollars per barrel. It gives them quite a bit of margin of safety in sub $50 barrel oil prices. In my opinion, this was aided by the ability of a good management team that has tremendous field and operational experience. Dr. Kenneth himself was a field man back in the days, which gives him the depth and the breadth of the industry to run hibiscus efficiently. Secondly, is the ability to execute production enhancements projects with a payback period of 5 years and an IRR of 15% as their target. This was shared to me at their last investor briefing. And last but not least, is their existing 2C resources, which may become commercially viable if they exploit it in an efficient manner. Part of the press, on Friday 5th of June, Hibiscus announced that they're going to purchase five existing PSC contracts from Spanish oil giant Repsol. This purchase effectively doubles their current production of 9,000 barrels of oil a day to 18,500 barrels of oil a day. Their current 2P reserves, 46 million barrels, will now jump to 67 million barrels and their 2P gas reserves now at 9 billion will jump to 93 billion standard cubic feet of gas. What does all this mean in cash flow for Hibiscus? They project it's going to bring in 225 million US dollars of net undiscounted cash flow over the next five years. So certainly exciting times for Hibiscus ahead. There you go, the catalyst for Hibiscus. Thanks for staying till the end and do watch some of our other videos on the channel. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram with the links below and I'll see you in the next video.